Thank you. Uh, David, thank you for those uh, distinctly too generous words of introduction. Um, when David asked me to come and talk this evening, we had a little bit of discussion about what I should uh, make as my theme, um, and I said that I did not want to end up talking about Brexit, although I'm sure that Brexit may surface uh, only tangentially, actually, in my, uh, in my main comments, but I am absolutely sure it'll come up in the course of the discussion afterwards. I said that what I wanted to discuss was a, a much larger and, I think, more fundamental question, which is, what is it to be a European? Um, is there a European identity? Uh, to be clear, I think there is one, uh, a European identity that we cannot deny um, and which we must think of the implications of and that is essentially my theme. And it's critically important to all of us, um, including to the British, but we'll come back to that. Uh, it's certainly important to the Irish. It is important to all those 500 million people who live on this end of the Eurasian landmass. And it's worth beginning at that point because it reminds us that Europe is a, an entity which has no natural geographic de definition. Clearly to the west, north and south, it has natural borders, but it does not to the east. It is just part of a single Eurasian landmass, geologically and geographically speaking. It's easiest to think of Europe as being defined by at least broadly speaking, the borders of the European Union. But are those borders necessarily permanent? Clearly not. The question of Ukraine comes up as soon as you ask about the permanency of Europe's borders to the east. The question of Turkey comes up as soon as you ask that question. I think in the case of Russia, it's at least fairly clear that Russia has a very different identity. Occasionally down the centuries, it has sought to convince itself and others that its outlook is essentially European, and many aspects of its culture are, of course, formed by a European engagement. And yet at its heart, it is the land of steppes and forests. It is a very Eurasian country. It has a geopolitical centre of gravity, which is well to the east of Europe, and a culture, of course, moulded to this day by its orthodox heritage, which marks it out so distinctly from the core areas of Europe. And we need to ask ourselves whether this Europe has any real identity beyond the geographic facts that I've just mentioned. For although the world of the 21st century is ever more global and interconnected, the importance of geopolitics has in no way declined there are some old and some new powers on the world stage. The question is, for Europe, in what way does it want to project itself on that world stage? There are new actors, new cultural challenges, new sources of instability, which we all face. And Europe cannot escape the fact that it has some very large neighbours to the east and a large continent to the south with which it is increasingly frequently and intensively interacting. Directly or indirectly, Europe will be impacted and profoundly challenged over the next century. How the Europeans respond will depend on what they have in common. What is their identity? What if uh, anything, amidst all of the kaleidoscopic variety, do we Europeans think we share? What is it to be a European in the modern age? Does it have any significance geopolitically, commercially, or culturally? Uh, what future, in short, does it have? That's my question for the evening. I think it's, in some ways, the biggest question that we all face. And if we don't think we face it, it is surely true that our children and grandchildren will. It's worth looking backwards. Few people, it's worth noting, have ever thought of themselves primarily as Europeans. In the four centuries up to 1914, when Europe was the dynamic center of the world, and when Europeans fanned out over the world globally to trade and to conquer, they defined themselves, of course, not by their Europeanness, but by their religion, by their language, 
and by their nationality. After 1945, in the wake of the moral and physical disasters of war and extermination, there was a new determination to achieve a robust and enduring peace in Europe. This was the vision of a small European elite in the late 1940s, but they were responding at that time to a widespread sense of exhaustion and disgust amongst Europeans, which it is perhaps hard these days to recall. And in the last 70 years, of course, the most pressing objective has been achieved. Not only is Europe at peace with itself, but war between the member states is all but unthinkable. And yet, the sense of European identity remains weak. It is still the case that majorities in every country of the European Union think of themselves not primarily as Europeans, but in national terms. In the case of Britain, I'm ashamed to say, fewer than half see their identity in European terms at all. And indeed, almost nowhere and almost never is the case for Europe argued in terms of identity, argued in terms of our being Europeans with something fundamentally important in common. The Brexit campaign, this is about the only time I'm going to mention Brexit, was characterised even amongst the Remainers as being an argument in terms of economic calculus. Are we better off as a member of a single market or are we better off trading with the wider world? At no point, even amongst the Remainers, or at almost no point, was there a serious discussion of what it means to say that Britain is part of the European identity. Does this matter in a 21st century world of globalisation? Yes, I think, and not least because this is also a world of great powers. A century that is in some ways not so very different from the 18th and particularly the 19th century European age, which was characterised by a concert of European powers. The Treaty of Westphalia of 1648 set a stage which was in the end not blown apart until 1914 and not comprehensively left behind until 1945. And I would argue that the world stage looks suspiciously like that still. Furthermore, the 21st century is not going to be Europe's age. Europe is now in long-term relative decline, relative, not absolute, relative decline, both politically and economically. Having led the world during the first industrial revolution of the 19th century, it then saw the centre of gravity shift away from it across the Atlantic, especially during and after the First World War. And since the apochal year of 1989, the rise of Asia has driven a new and historic shift of the centre of global economic gravity, this time, of course, to the east. At the centre of this remarkable phenomenon is the re-emergence of China as a great power, now the largest exporter in the world and asserting its right to a place in the sun. But not only China, India too, and Russia, by the way, still has a place on the world stage. Before the 19th century, the world's economic output was, of course, never far from some subsistence level, so that a country's share of global output was roughly in proportion to its share of the global population. Then, as now, China had the largest population in the world, and as late as about 1820, China had the world's largest economy. That changed, of course, with the onset of the Industrial Revolution, first the Europeans, then the Americans, later the Japanese, achieved enormous increases in world market share. At the peak of their relative outperformance, these developed countries, which never had as much as a fifth of the world's population, created about three quarters of the world's economic output. And that gap is now beginning to close again. By as soon as 2020 on present trends, 
China may well be the world's largest economy again. And that's just a milestone. Eventually, China will be by far the largest economy in the world. And India will, at a slower pace, and taking longer, therefore, also head in that direction. This great convergence is the most important fact about the first half of the 21st century. China's mood is in some ways reminiscent of Germany's in the late 19th century. Conscious that its time has come, determined to be taken seriously by the existing occupants of the world stage, burning with not so ancient grievances against some of those occupants. For Germany then, it was France. For China now, it's Japan in particular, but also the Western powers more generally. The question is therefore about the implications of all of this for Europe and its identity and for its place in the world. Is it, after all, basically nothing more than a series of small and medium-sized countries, yes, medium-sized, even Germany is smaller than several Chinese provinces, a series of countries with varying strengths and weaknesses, all seeking to swim on their own in the currents of the great global economic mainstream. Or is there more than that? Does Europe have a common identity which differentiates itself, if you want to look at it this way, from Asia in one direction, and perhaps also from America in the opposite direction, and which gives it something distinctive to offer and a distinctive basis to compete on that 21st century world stage. The question's important because the task ahead is daunting if Europe is to achieve the dynamism and flexibility needed to compete against those Asians in one direction and against the Americans in the other. And yet the original vision of the founders of what is now the EU has given, away, given way, as far as many of its citizens are concerned, to a confused sense of the complexity, of the distance, of the unresponsiveness of it all. They want to be assured of a predictable continuity which is not in fact available. And they feel very distant from the corridors of power. We know about Britain and its decision in the Brexit referendum. But remember in France that although one might say, I would certainly say, that the election produced the right result and you have a young and energetic pro-European president in charge there, remember that eight million people voted for an extreme right alternative and only just over half in the first round of the presidential elections voted for uh, parties that stood for an EU engagement at all. And what about Italy? The other great referendum last year, which produced not merely a marginal vote, but a rather strong vote against reform of the Italian state. And then, of course, we wait to see what happens on Sunday week in Germany. We think we know who the winner will be, but the mathematics are going to be important and it's not impossible that we'll see something of an embarrassment again from the right wing. There is in short little loyalty to or pride in the institutions which represent the European identity and almost nothing that could be described as fervent European patriotism. An observation which contrasts sharply with both the American and Chinese view of themselves. You probably are familiar with something that I regularly notice when I go to the US. How many houses have a flagpole in the front, on the front lawn with a stars of stripes fluttering from that flagpole? When did you last see something like that in a European context, particularly with the EU flag rather than the local national flag? Many, of course, brandish their national flag at the time of European or World Cup football matches, but that really isn't the same thing as a coherently articulated and fervently held European sense of 
identity and self-confidence. Meanwhile, Chinese patriotism, and sometimes one might add xenophobia, are an inescapable feature of a very lively and influential Chinese blogosphere, albeit under some uh, uh, pressure for a bit more control from the Chinese authorities at the moment. There is no European equivalent to this. Why the contrast? Well, partly, of course, because of the way European history has discredited nationalist patriotism. But more deeply, because it directly reflects a fundamental uncertainty about their own identity. Admiration for the extraordinary achievements of modern Asia has brought Europe's own uncertainties about its place in the world and about its values into sharp relief. Europeans are unsettled by the fear that the Asians will challenge and eventually overtake them in almost any area of activity. It seems that no area of economic activity is free from the competitive threat that this huge reservoir of human talent represents. The Americans face the same challenge, of course, but the Europeans ruefully recognise how much greater inventiveness, drive and flexibility in the American society and its economy, and how that has enabled them to continue to renew themselves in the most extraordinary and unpredictable ways. No European country or company has been able to match the spectacular successes of Silicon Valley, which few had even heard of at the time of the fall of the Berlin Wall. And all European history, of course, seems to cry out that there are no fundamental commonalities amongst us Europeans on which to build a confident European response to the global challenge. There seem to be just too many differences of language, of religion, of culture to permit, to permit a true common identity. No one could mistake Palermo for Stockholm, for example, or Limerick for Athens for example. The language, the appearance, the atmosphere, the style of living all seem to be so fundamentally different. What have we really got in common? Could it be argued that there is indeed a European identity and that this very variety is itself a crucial element in that identity? That it is precisely that rich, colourful kaleidoscope which makes Europe what it is, by contrast, for example, to the sort of bland uniformity that you're often struck by amongst American cities from one end of the continent to the other. But can this really be the basis of an identity? No, I would suggest, because identity is not just about traditional local colour in inverted commas. Alpine horns versus bagpipes, paella versus currywurst, beer versus wine, and so forth. It is language and history, including deep history, the kind of history which colours attitudes today, even when many individuals are only partly aware of it. These are the things that determine true identity. And we need to dig into this for a minute. European nations were, to a large extent, formed by language. The standardisation of French accompanied the extension of Paris-based French royal power through more and more of what is now the French state. The Hundred Years' War in the 14th and 15th centuries helped forge a national identity both in France and in England and it was the period in which the French language began to spread. It is also the time when English re-emerged from under its French cover, which had been effectively the language of the elite for the previous 300 years. The German and Italian identities were rooted even more firmly in their languages, in the absence 
in particular, of any national political identity. For Germany, of course, it was Martin Luther's translation of the Bible that drove the standardization of the German language, which in turn became the expression and vehicle for a rising German self-awareness in the 18th and 19th centuries, which had not really been there before. In Italy, it was Dante and the Inferno that did the same thing for a particular dialect of Italian and turned it into origin of the Italian that we know today. It was a slow process. In France, even as late as 1789, the time of the French Revolution, fewer than half of the French spoke the national uh, uh, dialect, is the wrong word to use, the, the mainstream language of the French, even as late as that. Nevertheless, the fact is that language became the powerful vehicle of national identity. Europe, of course, has had no unifying language for several centuries. It remains a linguistic patchwork with all of that means for cultural diversity and for the proliferation of identities. The contrast with both America and China is striking. America, the melting pot, was formed by the English language. First generation immigrants might speak it imperfectly for the rest of their lives, but the second generation became native English speakers and gradually melted into the new American culture so completely that often only their surnames betrayed where their ancestors had come from. China's story is completely different and yet in the end the result is the same. China was not a land of immigrants, of course. In fact, it is one of the most ethnically homogenous countries in the world. But it was a vast land of people who spoke different, though related, languages. And its bond was that famous ideological script, excuse me, ideographical script, ideographical script, which enabled a literate society to communicate and to strengthen its identity slowly, and which in turn, when the time came under the People's Republic, facilitated the deliberate spreading of Mandarin Chinese as the true unifying national language. The European experience is manifestly different from that. In fact, it's a journey in the opposite direction. The intellectual elite of the Middle Ages, of course, spoke Latin. Almost all intellectual discussion in Europe took place in Latin. And this lasted through into the 17th century. There's a wonderful story in London of Sir Hans Sloan, the great collector whose collection is the foundation of what we now know as the British Museum, and also come to that of the Natural History Museum, of which I have the great honor of being the chair. There's a wonderful story of him meeting up with Linnaeus, the great Swedish biologist, in about 1690. And Hans Sloan spoke several European languages, but Swedish was not amongst them. Linnaeus spoke only Latin, apart from Swedish. And so they have this conversation of which there are notes in Latin. It's one of the late examples of a European dialogue taking place in the only European language that we've ever had. But the fact is that it didn't last. So language is important and a big obstacle on the way to the creation of a European identity. The history of beliefs and ideas matters too, and of course it's related to this point about language. The destruction of European Christian unity brought about at the time of the Reformation ushered in more than a century of turmoil and war, of which we all have folk memories one way or another. The tangled stories of Reformation and national assertion in various European countries helped drive the cultures of Europe apart. The distinctive English Anglican settlement, the Dutch Protestant struggle against their Spanish overlords, the savagery of the religious wars in Germany culminating in the catastrophe of the Thirty Years' War, all this and more struck at the roots of a European identity. Again, this European experience is distinctive. America imported all of those European schisms as well as inventing a few of its own. 
but religious differences never threatened the integrity of its identity, and no one was ever defined as non-American because of their religion, or almost no one. There are one or two debatable exceptions to that. And, of course, one must also acknowledge that the very different issue of race nearly tore that country apart. China's experience has been different again. For centuries, the dominant Confucian ethos with its non-theistic metaphysics and its lack of interest in theological dogmatics of any kind has seemed to leave little room, most of the time at least, for religious passion and division. It's debatable whether European religious reformation needed to take such an explosive and divisive and destructive form. Historical what-ifs are always tempting. What if, for example, Martin Luther had been received by a young and new Emperor Charles V more sympathetically at the Diet of Worms in 1521? European Christendom would certainly have had to change. But could it have remained intact? Who knows? But even if the answer is yes, even if Charles V could have sponsored reform from within such that schism could have been averted, something other than theological dispute, dispute was fermenting in European intellectual circles by then. A new intellectual curiosity was beginning to eat away at the metaphysical certainties and the intellectual integrity of Christendom. The new world that was coming into view was that of Galileo, whose mente concipio, I conceive my own mind, was an assertion of the right to experiment and to explore without accepting any inherited preconceptions. In other words, the old view was fragmenting with the Renaissance as it gathered momentum. So, could this new spirit of rationalist enlightenment replace that integrated worldview with another basis for European identity? And the answer turned out to be no. The respect for reason, which was the essence of the Enlightenment project, was never going to fill the vacuum left by shared institutional faith. It was never going to compete successfully with the power of nationalism, which was everywhere on the rise by that time. Indeed, the Enlightenment itself, involved in an increasingly fragmented European intellectual atmosphere, so that it's misleading in some ways to speak of it as a uniform movement of the European spirit. In particular, Enlightenment as it developed in the three largest countries of Europe took on markedly different tones, reflecting and moulding three differing world views. The British, deeply imbued with a pragmatism which is of very long standing. The religious settlement reached under the Tudors is a classic, perhaps even foundational, case in point. Notoriously, Henry VIII declared himself head of the church, not out of theological conviction, but for reasons of state. He needed a son. Under his son, Edward VI, and then his elder daughter Mary, the policy swung first abruptly towards a thoroughgoing Calvinist Protestantism and then back to a reinstated Catholicism before reaching what turned out to be the enduring Anglican solution under Elizabeth, a solution which bears all of the hallmarks of that propensity which admirers call pragmatism and detractors call fudge. When confronted, so the story goes, with two versions of the words of administration at the Eucharist, the communion, the one more Catholic, the one more Calvinist in its implication, Elizabeth simply had the drafters put both together in a single paragraph. That formula is still in use in the modern Anglican liturgy. This tendency has continued to manifest itself in British intellectual and public life to this day. The British philosophical tradition embodies an individualism which owes its origins to John Locke, the progenitor of liberalism, and to the sceptical empiricism of David Hume, who denied that it was possible to say anything absolute about experience based on a priori reasoning. And, of course, Adam Smith, 
who was more interested in the wealth of nations than in the meaning of life. It's a tradition which doesn't encourage metaphysical speculation or indeed any form of philosophical system in inverted commas. If it has a worldview, it's a view which doesn't attempt to see beyond the horizon of experience and which crosses one bridge at a time. It's the world of enlightened self-interest and utilitarianism. And I would add as an aside, those instincts bedeviled the Brexit discussion. It is also the worldview that underlies the British approach to governance and constitutional reform as it has played out over the centuries. Political evolution in Britain has typically been incrementalist, opportunist, and often almost accidental, as attested by a long series of examples, good and bad, from Disraeli through Blair to Cameron. One way or another, the pragmatism of the British has been enough to fend off revolution so far, although whether it will fend off further splits in the United Kingdom remains to be seen. By stark contrast, of course, the French produced a revolution which was the biggest and most complex social explosion that the world had ever seen. Part chaos and terror, part human social engineering on an unprecedented scale, to this day, the French establishment has a more elevated view than the British of the role of the state in social development and more confidence in the leadership of a meritocratic and rational elite. Macron may claim to be the new presence on the French stage and to have founded a new movement, but he is straight out of the French establishment. And on the other hand, the French are notoriously ready to turn out on the streets in protest against government, uh, a distant echo of that original upheaval with its elemental violence. This is the enduring contest within the French soul, if you will, étatisme confronted by the barricades. Who wins depends from time to time. The outworkings are visible in French public life today in the rational consistency of the French economic and social model, in the comprehensive planning of the French national infrastructure, in the civil code, in the metric system promulgated in the early years of the revolution, in the zeal of the Académie Française for preserving the purity of the French language, and in much else besides. Where British pragmatism can be flexible to the point of being haphazard and drifting, French rationalism can be consistent to the point of being rigid and brittle. It is no coincidence that whilst Britain has had one endlessly shifting and unclearly defined constitution, France has had five republics as well as two empires and a monarchy in the two centuries since the revolution. But it's probably also the most efficient, though certainly not the lowest cost, state in Europe. When the Channel Tunnel opened in 1994, the French already had a high-speed rail link into Paris. It took the British another nine years to complete the connection to London. French, France established its national hub airport in the right place in the 1970s. Britain's hub airport is in the wrong place without adequate capacity, and there is still no finally agreed way forward. <coughs> and Germany. Wasn't it always a complicated blend of duty and discipline, but also of metaphysics and romanticism? The land of all those philosophers, poets, and composers. If France is the soil of rationalism and Britain is the home of a pragmatic utilitarianism, then Germany is the home of metaphysics and systems. The towering figures of Germany's thought world are Luther, Kant, and Hegel. It would take too long this evening to do any of those three justice, or to discuss how far the focus on duty and order in both Luther and Kant, and that sense of historical destiny that underpins Hegel, made the tragedies of the 20th century more likely and more terrible. Suffice it to say that Kant and Hegel in particular unleashed a probably endless debate about the individual and the community, about progress, the state and social justice, which has certainly not lost its intensity or relevance 
in the midst of rapid world historical change in the 21st century. Meanwhile, one thing is clear. The very idea of a common identity or a European special way stirs uneasiness in all three of those countries. The British, true to their empiricist and pragmatic heritage, dislike grand schemes. For the French, on the other hand, Cartesian rationalism and the social and political principles of the French Enlightenment, as embodied in the aspirations of the French Revolution, are a precious treasury of wisdom. After the Second World War, the European project was built on the premise of political leadership by France at a time when the Germans didn't want it and the British refused it. Engraved on a statue of Charles de Gaulle at the Rond-Point Champs-Élysées in Paris is a quotation from one of his speeches, which goes in English, there is a 2,000 year old pact between the greatness of France and the liberty of the world. This sums up that view of the French position in the affairs of the world like few other words could. Meanwhile, the deeply metaphysical instincts of Germany mark it out clearly from the other two. The search for the absolute in which all lesser realities are subsumed as a wonderful and untranslatable German word for this, aufgehoben. It's a quintessential German quest. And this in turn explains something whose true nature the British, at least, have never understood. The German commitment to European integration in general and to the Eurozone in particular. Does all this mean that looking at the case of the three largest European countries, there are such fundamental differences of worldview and therefore of identity that the formation of a coherent and meaningful European identity has no chance of success? The answer, I hope, is no. For the facts of geography and history nevertheless create common interests which we deny or ignore at our peril. Our European neighbourhood is fraught with danger and difficulty. Europe's relation with its huge neighbour to the east has always been fractious. I was in Berlin earlier this week and they are much more conscious of that fact than we are at the western edge of Europe. Poland is 60 kilometres away, Russia is not very far away from their minds. Our immediate neighbourhoods to the south and southeast are a continuous source of demographic pressure and of insecurity whose impact is increasingly felt throughout the European continent. So there are definite ge geopolitical risks that we share and where all logic would tell us we're better off facing them together. History also binds Europe. Not just recent history, but the deeper history of a continent which has been the cradle of so much wisdom and beauty, as well as the theatre of so much destruction. The violence, the creativity and the ferment, all of this is our inheritance. It is in, therefore so, in so many ways a history of tragedy, which lies beneath the peace of the last 70 years. In this, we're like the Chinese. China's history, too, is tragic, though in different ways, of course. In both cases, history weighs on the present, whether we like it or not. In both cases, it shapes the modern view of ourselves. By contrast, I would argue that history doesn't weigh on America in quite the same way. America is no longer young enough to be innocent, but it's still in an important sense the new world which left the old behind. Even now, this is a country of immense space with a population density much lower than that of crowded old Europe. And somehow that space still translates into a sense of potential the individual can always, at least they think so, move on. The myths of America 
uh, outward-looking, onward-looking, forward-looking, despite its growing recognition that its time as the world's single global superpower may be drawing to a close, America is not a country whose national psyche is overburdened by a sense of loss or guilt or shame. America and Europe are different because their history is different. And this means that our identities are different. One might ask the question whether Trump and the Trump phenomenon has changed all of that. I would argue uh, no, that some of those fundamentals I've just mentioned will long survive the rather unattractive Trump experience. We Europeans share much with America, of course. We share the values that are common to democracies, values which, by the way, are too often taken for granted by those who've never had to live without them and never had to fight for them. But at another level, there are obvious and profound differences in values and priorities. Americans are measurably more individualistic than Europeans. America's had no absolutist or totalitarian past to haunt its nightmares. It also nurtures more pre-enlightenment thought patterns, notably, for example, the widespread pre-scientific attitude towards evolution and human origins. So the differences are there, and they're many and profound. The centre of gravity of American attitudes is in a different place from a much more secularised Europe. So even if there are such deep commonalities amongst the Europeans, certainly when compared with others, then despite all the variety, not only on the surface but in their thought worlds, in the way that I've been discussing for France, Britain and Germany, can that commonality at that deeper level be reflected in a European identity and how can that identity project itself on the world stage of the 21st century? Churchill proposed in the aftermath of the war in 1946 the creation of a United States of Europe. It was a visionary proposal at that time. He ends the speech, you can Google it, it's quite a sports, short speech, with a plea, and this is the extraordinary thing, remember 1946, that France and Germany together lead the creation of this new United States of Europe. He did, of course, not expect Britain to be part of it. He got some things right and some things not. But even then, the notion of combining sovereignty, shared identity, shared governance was not new. In 1940, Churchill had offered France, in its hour of need, a union, a complete political union with Britain. Intriguingly, there is a still earlier version of a regional United States in part of Europe. The proposal for a United States of Greater Austria, which was floated in a fascinating book by a lawyer in the circle around Franz Ferdinand, the heir apparent to the Austrian throne, in about 1906. It was an idea that was well worked out in some detail. It envisaged the reconstruction of the then Austro-Hungarian Empire into a group of 16 national states with a federal structure under a constitutional monarchy. All of the issues of population mix that bedeviled the later Versailles negotiations he considered methodically in this proposal. Could it have ever worked? We don't, of course, know. But it offers a poignant glimpse of an alternative future that might have avoided the catastrophe that was ushered in with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand in 1914. What we have instead is a European Union which is on a unique journey. It has progressed from an economic starting point, from a coal and steel community, through a common market and the European Economic Community, to what is now the European Union, through a series of treaties that have continually increased the degree of integration. And what is the ultimate end of this project? <laughs>
That question, of course, exposes the, diverges, the divergences and the fractured identities of Europe. At one end of the spectrum, you have the British who have now taken their decision to go a separate way, or at least form a separate form of partnership with the European Union. At the other end of the spectrum, you have those who really do look for an ever closer integration, an ever closer union of the peoples of Europe. The divergences tell us that there's nothing guaranteed about the integrity of the European Union. And there is nothing guaranteed about the integrity of several of its member states either. The fragility of the British identity has been exposed in the last two or three years by the Scottish. Spain notoriously has its centrifugal tendencies, so does Belgium. Italy's natural, national identity is probably more fragile than we recognise. And then there is Poland and Hungary, both of whom are at the moment fractious members of the EU who are in deep dispute with the EU about some of the very fundamentals of the EU project. Once again, history matters. Fragility of identity is often the result of failure to confront one's own past. It's doubtful whether even now the British have fully confronted the real causes of the existential challenge they now face. The present government calls for a global Britain in close partnership with the EU. Boris Johnson, I heard him myself say this, we are not withdrawing from Europe, we're withdrawing from the EU, but we are not withdrawing from Europe, we intend to be more engaged than ever in Europe. Those are literally words I have heard him say. This implies a new identity for Britain, of course, or perhaps a reversion to an older one, but if that identity is going to be robust, then it needs honest confrontation with the past. It needs honest confrontations with the failure of British political leadership in the 40s and 50s and with the sins of imperialism in the 19th century and I might add, since we're here in Limerick, with the debacle of the, Ar the British treatment of the Irish over several hundred years. The Britons are not the only ones of whom this is true, of course. But this is a general point of profound importance. So back to my question. What is the European identity? How will Europe project itself on the world stage? For better or for worse, it is striking how familiar this question is to the German psyche. It has historical resonances in a German context from the long-standing and subtle balances within the Holy Roman Empire. Some people even think that the EU is a bit like the old Holy Roman Empire. Germany is a land where over a long history, people have seen themselves as involved in layered identities. At the lowest and most local level, they have what they call their Heimat, their home, the place they came from. It does not at all mean that this is where you currently live or ever lived, but it is the place which you recognize as being your roots. Then there's a regional identity born of long historical differences. The Bavarian identity is the most obvious case in point, but it's certainly not the only one, as any Saxon will tell you, and as any person from Hamburg will tell you. In the darkest days of the Second World War, one of the most interesting and poignant of the small resistance groups in the Third Reich is what became known as the Kreisau Circle named after a country house uh, of that name, um, owned by one of the leaders of that group. He was a von Moltke. He was of that family that produced the great General von Moltke in the First World War and in the Prussian-French War before that. He was amongst the very few Germans who, at the time of the fall of France in 1940, regarded it as an unmitigated evil, not as a cause for exhilaration. His and their thinking about a new order after the demise of the Third Reich 
would seem outmoded in some ways to us, particularly as it was conditioned by a widespread sense that the parliamentary system of the Weimar Republic had failed the country. But what was striking was their commitment to an advocacy of a united European governance within which regional identities with cohesive cultural and historical identities could exist together in trust and peace. Most of that circle were executed in 1944. But the issues they wrestled with have an obvious and continuing relevance in the modern Europe. They are far from just a historical curiosity or just a footnote to the history of the Nazi era. Today, Germany's regionalism is highly stable because it is so deeply rooted, and Germans find it relatively easy to slip another layer of identity on top of those other layers I've just mentioned and think of themselves, therefore, as Europeans. The threats to the British, Spanish, Belgian, Italian identities have varying origins and may or may not prove fatal to the integrity of those countries. But they certainly mean that radical decentralisation is inevitable. And the EU does offer a context in which regional identities can find their own level, either within an existing member state, the Bavarians in Germany, no secessionist tendencies there whatsoever, or independently in their own member state, as, of course, the Irish experience demonstrates so powerfully. Why is all this so important? Because in the last analysis, Europe is more than just a governance structure and a set of institutions that nobody really loves. For Europe is also the history of how we got to being the peaceful union of peoples. It's a history, as I've already mentioned, that is both sublime and tragic. It is a continent which is a treasure trove of beauty for all of the destruction that it has seen, from its Ice Age art to its Neolithic pottery, through classical Greece and Rome, through the Renaissance to the Romantics and down to the present day. The fruits of European spiritual, philosophical and aesthetic exploration are, taken as a whole, the richest, most diverse, most vibrant, most searching anywhere on the planet. And as a result, Europe does have core values which have been hard won through history and which are important to the world. They are common values which are the heritage of traditions of thought shaped by such towering figures as Galileo, whom I've mentioned, Erasmus, Descartes, Locke, Hume, Kant, Hegel, Darwin, and of course many others too. Out of their different perspectives, out of the many and painful sins that we Europeans have committed over the generations, has emerged something profoundly important for the whole world of the 21st century. A commitment to rationalism, democracy, individual rights and responsibilities, the rule of law, social compassion, an understanding of history as dynamic, open and progressive, even the sense on the part of some that any European loyalty cannot be the last or highest stage of identity, that some, in some emergent sense we're also citizens of the world, even this is implied by those European values. This too is therefore part of Europeans, Europe, Europe's proposition to the world of the 21st century. It's worth our loyalty, it's important to the world, and if anybody asks me what the end point of the journey of the European project is, my answer is a metaphor. The European project is like those marvellous medieval cathedrals that dot the face of Europe and in one of which we're sitting this evening. In almost all of those cases, it took hundreds of years for them to reach the form that we now know. In all those cases, those who laid the foundation stone knew they would not leave to live to see the final product, and they also knew that the design would evolve as time went on. Some of them didn't work, some fell down. Some bankrupted the cities that embarked on them. At their best, 
they are some of the most glorious creations of human spiritual and artistic endeavour. They are a metaphor for what Europe has to offer to the wider world. Thank you.